So hello and welcome to our fourth physical activity um, Fuse pop-up workshop. It's sort of crazy how fast time is going through today. So today we're going to be looking at um, is 20 plenty for health. So as you're going through the presentation today, if anyone wants to do any tweeting, you can see the hashtag there. So hashtag Fuse um, Poor, capital P A W. It'd be great if people could um, tweet their experience of the workshop. So a little bit of an overview and housekeeping. So I'm Alison Innard, a senior lecturer at sport, in sport and exercise science at Teesside. Um, so I'll be doing the introduction as I'm doing now. And then I'll pass you over to Professor Ruth Jepson, who will be looking at is 20 plenty for health. And then we'll be moving on to Phil Jones, who will be looking at delivering um, 20 miles per hour speed limits. Once we've done those presentations, I'll be passing over to Natalie Connor, who will be chairing the Q&A questions. Then we'll have a short break at about half past four, and then we'll end with an informal um, coffee and discussion. So just before we start, just a little bit of house rules. So just to remind you all to keep your mics muted, please, just while we're going through the presentations. Um, and if everyone could keep their own videos off, that'd be brilliant just to help with streaming quality but of course in the social or if you have a question you want to ask in the Q&A section of course you can um, turn your camera off to talk. During the presentations if you think of a question you want to ask please put it in the chat box um, and like I said Nat Natalie Connor will take over chairing that uh, and then when we come to the social aspect again if you want to type and um, um, sorry if you want to speak put a question mark in the chat box or just raise your hand or we'll just see how we go when we get to the informal part how people are feeling last the last workshop everyone got the cameras on and we had a really great discussion so we'll just roll with it and we we'll see how we go today uh, and two final points just as a reminder um be professional as we always are and just make sure that if um if you feel that someone's behaving inappropriately then we have um, ruth wilson you can contact to flag that with her so just a very quick thank you. So of course, huge thanks to our two speakers today. We're all really looking forward to the, to the presentations. And of course, the FUSE team behind the scene, Ruth, Cheryl, Laura, and Mark, and then the FUSE physical activity team. So the names are all listed on the board there. So huge thanks to everyone for all the work that goes in behind the scenes to get this up and running. And of course, you guys out there who are here to listen and hopefully learn and, and be inspired. And one final slide from me, um, just a reminder of the FUSE quarterly research meeting that's coming up on the 25th of November. Um, these slides will be shared so you can access this data later. Okay, and that's enough for me. I will pass you over to Ruth. Hi, uh, I'm here. <laughs> I'm just gonna try and share my screen just now. Um, can you just let me know if that's working okay? Yep, yeah, we can see that, Ruth. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, thank you for um, inviting me here to talk about Is 20 Plenty for Health? Um, what I'm going to do today, it was a really big project, so I'm going to give you quite a big overview. But I think the things that I've been really interested in, in interested in during this project is as a really complex public health intervention that's crossing a number of systems. And I think there's been a lot of talk about systems-based approaches to public health as well. So I'm gonna to be touching on some of the lessons we've, we've learned in this project as well. So it's a bit more, for those of you that aren't particularly interested in 20 mile an hour, hopefully you'll get something out about sort of implementation of public health interventions, and also the evaluation of them as well. Um, so the evaluation uh, commenced in March 2017. It was an NIHR funded project for three and a half years. We've just finished, well, we just, we've got a little bit of a, an, an extension. Um, but we're finishing up now and it consists of four different work packages looking at different aspects of delivery of the intervention and the outcomes and it's looking at both um, Edinburgh and Belfast as well. So we were really interested in this will sort of feed in hopefully to what Phil talks about after after me about 
policy and what led to it being implemented and what we can learn about that to help implementation or transferability more widely across the UK. So we did a large bit of work on that. We then did the sort of more normal evaluation bits, which was, you know, do outcomes change or not? Does it lead to um, significant public health outcomes? And I, I will talk a bit about that, well, a lot about that. And that we used different methods. We used natural experiments before and after. Um, we used routine data. We used data we collected ourselves. We used data from uh, partners such as Sestrans as well. And then we did a large piece of qualitative work to understand sort of um, why things are working or why they aren't. And then we were hoping to do an economic evaluation, but that's slightly been held up. But I'll, I'll talk about the reasons why as well. This is the team. Um, hopefully you will know some of these, especially for those of you that are interested in physical activity. We were a big bunch from all over just about all over the UK, including um, Ireland, right down as far as University of Exeter, who then moved up to East uh, St Andrews. But there was quite a lot of us involved um, throughout the project. We This is our initial programme theory, and I'm sure all of you are probably used to looking at logic models and programme theory. But just quickly, I'm going to be looking at our more recent one a lot so it goes from left to right inputs are all the people that are involved with the decision making the delivery the implementation and you can see there's a lot of different um people from lots of different systems and it's this bit that is really interesting in that you've not only got the transport but you've also got police you've got neighborhood partnerships community councils you've got local and national governments you've got sustrans so there's a lot of different people that are invested in somewhere or another in the delivery or implementation you've then got the different activities which then we hope will lead on to a change first of all in attitudes behaviors and speed then more attitudes and behavior than the traffic and health outcomes that we want to see achieving um, so that's where we started off with and what we ended up with, with was actually with something much more complicated and I'm going to talk through these um, in each section so I'll be coming back to this all the way through. The first thing we're really interested in and again this will speak to, I'm not going to talk too much because I'm sure Phil will be talking more about this is what actually gets it on the agenda? What what gets some things to the point of people think it's a good idea and they're willing to spend the money in implementing it? And so we looked at a lot of data and we did a lot of stakeholder interviews in both Edinburgh and Belfast. I'm just going to focus on two bits. You can see there's loads of, of stuff there, the sort of levers or the drivers that got it on the agenda. And I think what's interesting from a research perspective is um, the influence of evidence. Now, what we found was that the background evidence on effectiveness of 20 mile an hour was, was important in the early days when the, ide when the idea was initially sort of talked about even before it got on any agenda. Um, so without the evidence that it was in some way effective on some health outcomes, particularly in the early days, it was around casualties, reducing speed and reducing casualties. It's unlikely that it would ever have got in the agenda on the first place. However, once it makes it onto the political agenda, the evidence then only plays a very small role. Like, so our research evidence actually becomes almost um, inconsequential. And, you know, there's lots of other things that people start being interested in. And it's this idea about you're, you're trying to implement something and you've got an intervention that you know about its effectiveness. But if you're trying to in intervene in, into or put the intervention into a complex system, or in this case, a series of systems, Lots of, there's lots of other interplaying factors that need to be taken account of. And this is when you get all these contextual factors becoming much more important. And some examples we got from up to the ridiculous about pizza delivery times was even stuff about 
best timetabling, carbon emissions, so the impact on other things, because as most of you know from systems-based thinking, nothing ever comes in uh, into a vacuum. It will always displace something else. So you always have to think about what other things are potentially being displaced. So if you impact 20 mile an hour, what will it impact on? And in this case, it was things like buses, it was taxi drivers were upset about journey times. You know, there was lots of other people that felt it would impact on them. So in Edinburgh and Belfast, it was very gradualist. It was almost like we, you get the easy wins first. So the easiest win is always around children and schools. That's If you ever see 20 mile an hour in any cities, they always seem to start with those. So that was an easy win. And interestingly, as I said before, over time, it went from the shift in being around all around road safety to being something more ideologically, ideological and visionary is about better communities, um, wider economic and environmental agendas, such as in Edinburgh, for example, around tourism and, you know, having livable communities. Um, so the other thing that happened in Edinburgh to really sort of speed things along and get that shift in people being really anti it to sort of getting people on board was by having a pilot scheme that showed that actually it didn't affect other things massively and that was critical in gaining widespread public support for the wider rollout so i'm then gonna talk about the activities because it's a bit like, because it's a complex intervention, there's a number of different activities that actually make it up. People think it's just about, it's 20 mile an hour and they think it's just one thing, but actually it's made up of four quite distinct activities. Um, and these, each of these activities, depending on how they're implemented, will have an effect on, how, uh, on, on your outcomes. And think of it in a bit of a way like a dose. If you are told to do, you know, exercise and diet and take a drug, maybe if you do one of these at maybe not the right dose to get the effect you need, well, you aren't going to see an effect probably. So it's really important to understand in Edinburgh and Belfast how they differed in each of these four activities. So what's interesting in Belfast, it was just around the city centre. So they had these streets you see on the left, those streets there and they implement it at one time point, whereas in Belfast, um, sorry, in Edinburgh, we had a whole city-wide approach. So we took the whole of the city, which you can see is much larger area, and they did it in three time periods over two to three years, two and a half years. So Belfast, it was on a very small scale. It was city centre covering 76 streets, um, whereas in Edinburgh, as you can see, it was over the whole city. Now, the other thing to say that's quite important is 50% of Edinburgh was already had the 20 mile an hour, either in zones or they had regulations. So the actual 20 mile an hour implementation that sounded like this massive thing was only increasing the number of streets in Edinburgh from 50 to 80%. And so on this uh, diagram, the existing 20 mile an hour streets are in green, the new ones are in blue, and then 20% of the streets stayed the same. And they're, they're mainly the arterial routes, which uh, you can see in the sort of orange and brown, which stayed at 30 and 40. So it's, it wasn't, even though we say citywide, it wasn't as sort of dramatic as you may expect. The other thing was about uh, signs and lines. Now, this particular approach is not using any furniture. So not using speed bumps, um, all those other things, which I've forgotten what they're called now. It'll come back to me in a minute. Um, but just using signs and lines. Now we know for a fact that signs and lines are not as effective as having um, the bumps or whatever. However, they may be more acceptable and they're definitely a lot cheaper and they require less maintenance. So there's, you can see there's a trade-off here. So both Edinburgh and Glasgow decided to go for signs and lines. So they just had signage and the sort of circles, the, the roundels they're called on the roads. 
Um, Edinburgh had more again than, than Belfast um, and interestingly in our focus groups we found that these the roundels the things on the, the on the road were actually what they found were most effective in terms of the signage. Finally there's the educational campaign and awareness raising. Now Edinburgh had a dedicated official, they had specific campaigns um, we've got the enforcer here on the right hand side with the little boy. They had lots of sort of children going out on the streets, um, stopping people that were going too fast. Sorry. Um, and they had on the back of the buses as well. Belfast, um, on the other hand, and this comes back to this idea of dose, they had a bit of signage, some news releases. But they didn't have much else and what's really interesting about this is that road safety education and road services sat in different government departments so it's about where two systems are working independently and not joining up and not joining up their thinking really and this could be one of the reasons why they didn't have this whole educational campaign whereas Ed edinburgh put much more resources for it because it's sat in, within the same department in terms of focus groups, you know, there was always some people, um, they call them in Edinburgh, the council's called the council, but they think they're clowns. And um, so there's, there's quite a bit of negative views of the our council anyhow. And so there were some people that felt they didn't really publicise it, other thought it was great, as you may expect. And then this issue of enforcement, again, is a really interesting idea. And I'm going to be coming back to this when we look at, at the outcomes, because in both cities, it was quite similar. Neither wanted to really go down the enforcement route. Now, there's a few reasons for this. One, they just didn't think it was a good idea. They wanted people to be self-compliant, you know, um, self-enforcing. The other thing is, you know, police are a completely different system and they've got different budgets, they've got different priorities. So there was a big issue about you know that the, so the transport department was trying to implement it but they were expecting enforcement to happen by the police department so it was these competing priorities they did train up in edinburgh some um, offices in speed detection um, but as i say in the early days and actually still now there's still very little enforcement and they do want people to self-enforce interestingly enough though in the focus groups people wanted that they really wanted it. They wanted people to be fined, especially the others that they thought were breaking the rules. So there was a strong sense that there was insufficient enforcement and that they wanted more of that. So just to summarize that, um, different levers influence decision-making in, in both the cities. But this idea that research evidence can get sank on the agenda, but in its Am I still there? I think we lost you very briefly just before this slide, Ruth. So perhaps you could hit what you were just saying before. Okay. So did you have you, did you hear me with the summary of findings? Part way through, I think. Yeah, I think I saw it go off. Sorry about that. Yeah. So there was this sort of issues about um, how much and how fully it was implemented and the differences between the two cities which you will see had a, a quite a marked effect probably on the results that we saw. So that's the sort of the bit on the left about the activities, how we got to be there. Now I'm going to move on to um, some of the findings we got around uh, the outcomes. And we did a bit of work around the perceptions of 20 mile an hour in Edinburgh. So we were interested in quite a lot of things around, you know, self-enforcement, what they thought of the 20 mile an hour, whether they thought it was working, influence on safety. We did, in Edinburgh, we were able to do some before and after in the different zones. So we were able to do some work comparing different zones, pre-implementation and post-implementation. 
Uh, in Belfast, we could only do post implement implementation because they delivered it or implemented it in 2016. We did 15 qualitative focus groups within 100 people and all the people involved in this sort of um, the studies were those either living, working in or passing through regularly. So those were our inclusion criteria. We did some factor analysis on our survey. We had loads of questions and we identified five clusters of questions. And these are quite interesting in a way in terms of detraction and resistance. So that's people saying we don't like the 20 mile an hour. There wasn't any change in it. And in fact, there was um, more support for 20 mile an hour after it had been implemented rather than what they thought about before. There was a significant increase in rule following of those they said that they would follow the rules, which is great because it, it tends to suggest that over time self enforcement is, is sort of building up. There was no significant change around these factors of child safety, these clusters of questions and perceptions, but it, within specific questions there were, and I'm going to just talk about them now because particularly for those of you that are interested in active travel. Um, hopefully you can see this all right. So there was four questions we asked about how they felt in terms of cycling, walking, about children near roads and children crossing the roads. And all of these showed a significant increase pre-implementation and one year post-implementation. Um, particularly around child safety, and all, but also safety about cycling on the roads. Uh, one of them saying, I'm more confident, maybe I'm more aggressive now. I don't know if we necessarily want that. Um, <laughs> and the other one actually um, saying, since the 20 mile an hour zone came in, it's probably made it a little easier to nip into the traffic and cross the road there. I'm not sure we quite want too much of that either. Um, but people did feel safe. And I think what's interesting about this is that it's this idea of perceptions of safety. So and we don't know this, but there is a potential that even if speed didn't decrease, just having the road markings there and the fact that it said 20 mile an hour may um, cause people to feel safer. So what I'm saying is it could be independent of actually um, the traffic changing at all. So then we went on to look at things like reduction in speed, traffic um, in, and traffic flow, which is volume. This is the only slide I'm going to show you about Belfast. Everything else from now on is going to be about uh, Edinburgh. And the reason is we saw no differences. Um, so we looked at one and three years after in terms of traffic speed, and but nothing was really significant. There was a slight change in volume and not really any difference in road traffic collisions. Now, you can, I'll leave you to hypothesize why, I will probably, I'll talk about that later as well. Um, but that's the only slide I'm going to show you on Belfast. The rest of it is about Edinburgh. So in Edinburgh, uh, pre and post, we found a overall a difference in about 1.34 uh, reduction in miles per hour. And it was only measured on 66 streets. This was uh, council data. We didn't have any control over which streets or where or how many. But there was a re significant reduction and that does relate to a significant reduction in casualties. What's interesting, and I'm going to show you a bit more about this in a minute, is that over 24 miles an hour, the change was greater. You can see it's up to two miles an hour, whereas less than 24 miles, it only goes down by 0.72. There was also a difference, if you look down in the second table, around which zone you're in. So some zones, for example, zone 1B, which is in the rural west, you've got the highest reduction in miles an hour. And there's various reasons you can argue for that, that, you know, the the speeds, well, they're about the same before, but, um, you know, you can argue that maybe you've just got so much congestion or whatever in the city centre that you're like, not likely to get much of a change. 
We also looked at main um, areas, main roads, which went to 20 mile an hour and residential roads, but there wasn't much of a difference there. If we look at this on, uh, as a visualisation, what you can see here is the red lines are 20 mile an hour and then the green is the pre-20 and the median speed is post-20 is in yellow. Now there's a couple of things I want to just highlight. It's bimodal um, and you can see, so you can see there's two peaks, two distinctive peaks. If you look at after, oops, what you can see is that the peak has shifted, the second peak, the higher speed limits, it's shifted to the left. So what that suggests is that overall speeds are shifting down the way. And that's really important for us as public health people to understand that. In terms of volume, there was no difference. Now, the last sort of set of um, outcomes I'm going to talk about are those involving casualties. And we actually saw quite a big difference, like a 30% reduction in casualties over the three years. Again, there was differences between, if you look down in the second one, in different areas as well. In the city centre, there wasn't really much of a difference, whereas out in some of the other areas there was. Here's a visualisation. So this is a, a time series. And as you can see, there was a, an already a trend. This is from July 2013 of a reduction anyhow um, in road traffic collisions. So we needed to try and see whether, you know, actually the 20 mile an hour made any difference or if it was just going down anyhow. So we did do some um, extrapolated versus observed. And as you can see, the observed is much lower or is lower. And so it suggests that it is due to the 20 mile an hour. So overall, um, yeah, that's collisions. We also then looked at casualties. And again, we saw a reduction in around 39% um, in the rates. And there were differences within the fatal, serious and slight as well. In terms of progress on our economic evaluation, we had a problem. You might ask me or wondered why, why she not talked about, you know, the numbers of people cycling and numbers of people walking. And the fact is that it was one of the outcomes we intended to look at, but we were reliant on Ed, um, Edinburgh City Council data and also Sestrans data. So data such as like from Sestrans such as intercept surveys um, and then there was pedestrian counts and bicycle counts. Unfortunately, when we came to look at those data, none, are, none were usable for various reasons. Um, particularly the cycling and walking counts weren't usable because they're either not in the right places or they had been turned off for months on end and we just couldn't get the data we needed. There's also a problem with counts anyhow as those, and I'd really like a bit more discussion of this potentially, as those you will know that with counts, you don't know if it's like just one person going more often or a whole load of people starting. You don't know whether the people have just changed their routes or changed their mode of transport or their form of exercise. You know very little just from counts. It's a very sort of rudimentary measure of change of active travel, I, I would argue. Anyhow, we are still going to do some economic evaluation. It's just on hold a bit now. So in summary, significant barriers to getting 20 mile an hour and facilitators on the agenda. Evidence is really useful at the beginning, but then other things take over. Um, there are some issues that they're focused on things over and above health outcomes, such as a cleaner and greener place to live. Um, Belfast results were not as significant as Edinburgh in relation to the main outcomes. In fact, there was very little difference we could find. And I asked you before to think about why. I think there's there's lots of reasons. There's, it was city centre only, remember, and there's lower seat speeds in city centres usually anyhow because of the amount of traffic. It was city centre rather than city wide. And I think this is really interesting. I'm really glad we had the city wide because 
it just gets people thinking about it much more rather than just just driving into the city centre. And if people don't ever drive into the city centre, and many of us don't, you never sort of think about it. So it just sort of it's about that whole community approach rather than a very targeted approach in the city centre. And also there was this idea that they didn't really get the dose in the same way maybe as Edinburgh did in terms of not only the sort of spread of it, but also they had very little in education and, and enforcement wasn't great on either side. But those were just some reasons as to why potentially it wasn't significant. And this is my last slide that, as I said, we had decrease in traffic speed, um, a larger decrease where the average speed was higher, reductions in traffic speed for six of the seven zones, uh, no change in volume, but we did have reductions in road to traffic collisions and casualties. And the reduction in annual, uh, average annual road traffic collisions was found to be about 36 per year. This is the last slide. And there were some very unkind people on my team who used to spread the rumor that it was me inside that suit. And that's me, I'm finished now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was a, a really interesting talk and, and certainly just being able to look at those those two different sites, um, you know, with Belfast and, and Edinburgh and, and comparing them. And I think it it just hits home the, the complexity, some of the issues you brought up around. It's not just about kind of the political elements or or health and that evidence, but those are the contextual factors. So you you know you wouldn't think we've got to listen to the the voice of those those pizza delivery drivers and the taxi drivers about the the impact impact on them. So that's you know certainly interesting. Um, and also just looking at that that trend when you brought up the slide with the the drop um, the drop in speed. And I was thinking they're still not adhering to that twenty mile an hour limit. There's been a reduction, but actually that trend over time. And, and actually bringing just general speeds down will, will obviously have an impact. Uh, and just looking at that last slide there, you can see uh, there's, the, it's, there's a compelling evidence there from that study uh, about that, that speed limit. So, so thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for that presentation. Um, we're gonna, um, in terms of questions, we're gonna leave questions until after we've uh, heard from Phil. So if you do start to have any um, questions start typing them in the chat box that would be brilliant so we're just handing over now to Phil Jones who's going to talk about 20 mile an hour speed limits but from, from a different perspective from that policy perspective um, Phil has been kind of over has over 30 years of experience working um, at that that policy level um, and has uh, he founded Phil Jones Associates I think in 2003 uh, and so has a lot of expertise in traffic analysis, transport planning and highway design. So we're going to get that different perspective from Phil in this discussion. OK, over to you, Phil. Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, everyone can hear me OK and see the slides, hopefully. Um, yeah, so, so I'm going to uh, start with a little bit of um, sort of guidance and policy and then and then a couple of case studies. One, a town in Kent and uh, Faversham. Uh, and the other, the whole of Wales. So uh, I managed to make it alliterative by talking about Kent and Cymru. Um, so uh, to start with, yeah, so I, I'm a practitioner, really. I mean, I kind of touch uh, the academic world. And it's very interesting. I really like to do that. Um, but essentially, my job, I guess, is to try to actually achieve change on the ground. Um, and very often, we are, you know, we, we are led and our, our clients or our um, local authorities who we may or may not be working for or we may be dealing with, you know, very much led by government policy and, and, and guidance. So um, current guidance on setting speed limits, and they're, and they're called local speed limits because we've got some national speed limits like 70 on motorways and 60 on de-restricted roads and so on. But um, local speed limits set by local authorities, there's a, there's a guidance note on that published by the Department of Transport. It's called Circular 1 of 13. So it just means it came out in 2013. Um, and it's an interesting document. I think it's due for a revision. In fact, in Wales, it will have to be revised um, for the reasons I'll explain. But it almost sort of faces two ways. There's a whole view about speed limits generally that they should be um, self-explaining, in other words, or self-enforcing, that, it, that it's, it's, it's considered wrong to put in a speed limit that most drivers would regard as inappropriate. Uh, and so it's, 
it, it's almost kind of giving the vote to drivers really you know and, and classic highway engineering is actually to use statistical speed measurements and determine the speed limit from the 85th percentile speed that, that drivers are actually choosing to do but of course that ignores the the impact of those speeds on people who aren't in vehicles but anyway um dft document still kind of nods at that by saying they're evidence-led and self-explaining reinforce people's assessment of what's a safe speed to travel that means drivers self-compliance and then they go on to say that if the mean speed is already at or below 24 then if you just put a 20 mph speed limit you will get reasonable compliance i think even that's stretching it slightly and many authorities have taken that as an indication of when you should allow um, or when you should use 20 mile an hour speed limit at that 20 existing speed of 24. nevertheless the, 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 the circular also talks about the benefits of any speed reduction. So this is based on some research that Transport Research Laboratory did quite a few years ago. Um, obviously, it, it, it's bounded, but with, with, at, at, around these speeds, even small reductions in speed can lead to a significant reduction in collision frequency. And, the, and this stat is often quoted around 6%. So um, there's a benefit to even you know, any reduction in speed. And, and, and the document also talks about um, how back in 2013, authorities had been then, and it refers to Portsmouth, who was quite a pioneer in this, had begun to introduce these large scale 20 MPH limits without traffic calming. Because uh, in the past, they tended to be restricted to small zones with traffic calming, but, but Portsmouth led the way and in, in introducing wide area limits. And, and, the, and the note sort of gives a, a, a cautious nod to that. Um, and it says you could, and it also says you can consider 20 MPH limits over a large number of roads um, wh where the speeds are at or below 24 over a number of roads. So it doesn't say over every road in that area, it says over a number of roads. And that's an interesting choice of words. Um, but nevertheless, some authorities have, have chosen to kind of not take that point really. Uh, well, I'll explain when we come to Faversham. So yes, so but I mean, uh, there's a lot of evidence, and um, this is just one. This is a um, journal of transport and health um, that uh, um, um, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with. Looked at um, speed reductions in in Bristol, and obviously the work that Ruth has done in Edinburgh and and Belfast. Um, so we we do see that there is a, a reduction in speed, and that and the largest reduction, interestingly, is on the busier roads the, or the faster roads, the A and B roads. Uh, um, which is quite interesting. Um, a, 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 again, a few years ago now, or about um, I think three or four years ago, um, Atkins Consultancy did a very comprehensive research, research study into 20 miles per hour. Um, and they produced this graph, which I think is quite interesting. So this is um, a speed distribution. So as you go up the curves, you get the proportion of vehicles that are exceeding that, that speed. So, um, and you can see where, where 20 lies. So, so the 50th, uh, median speed means that at that speed, so um, uh, around 15 miles per hour on 20 mile an hour roads, um, half the vehicles were exceeding that speed and half the vehicles were below it. The, the, the solid and dotted lines show before and after the um, speed limit was changed from 30 to 20. So what you can see by the red lines is that the introduction of a 20 mile an hour limit made very little difference to the, the, the median speed. Quite understandably, if people are already driving at 20, then putting a sign up that says 20 makes little difference. For um, roads where the speeds were between 20 and 24, it, it made about um, uh, one mile per hour difference in the median speed. And for those roads where the median speed was above 24, the grey line, then median speeds came down by about 1.5, 1.6 miles per hour. So again, you know, we can see here that, that the faster the before speed, the greater the change in speed by introducing a 20 limit, even if we don't achieve compliance. So um, what does that what does that mean for, for policy? Well, um, can to counter council. So lots of highway authorities develop policies. Every highway authority is kind of sovereign. They can they can set their own policies. So Kent um, County Council in their form of policy, they were very strong and they said um, because Kent police and this is about the enforcement point, will not support 20 MPH speed limits unless the average speed of vehicles is 24 or less. So you get this kind of, almost kind of um, catch 22. If the speeds are too high, you can't put in a slower speed limit. Um, it, they have to, drivers have to be going more slowly before it is permitted. And that I think is because of 
the, as, as, as Ruth said, you know, local people will demand enforcement. Um, they feel that, that enforcement is needed. And the police are wary of enforcing speed limits that they believe will be unpopular. And because drivers um, would, would uh, many no drivers would be exceeding these speed limits, they fear unpopularity and, and, and are concerned about it. They also have concerns about um, use of resources. And if there's not a, a, a clear road safety problem at a particular site, they believe that their resources are not being well used. So, so um, uh, DFT give clear guidance. That means 24 miles an hour. So Kent's policy was um, not to impose, not to put in 20 MPA H limits without traffic calming where the speed was above 24. A very clear blanket statement. And um, sorry, County Council, I won't go into this. Again, the same. This is their current policy. Same, same approach. Where the existing mean speeds are above 24, a um, traffic calming measures will be required. Uh, that's a zone, not a limit. And, and you can see the chart there, it talks about um, a, a cut of a 24, new lower speed limit only allowed with supporting highway measures, which are expensive and, and sometimes quite um, controversial and popular, putting in speed humps because of noise and, and air pollution and so on. So it becomes quite a problem. Interestingly, th this, this is a, a, a chart based on a formula that's actually um, given in the DFT's guidance. And it, the, the formula says MSC, which is, um, uh, uh, mean uh, change change in median speed or mean speed change um, uh, is that formula um, dependent on the before mean speed, and so you can you, if you plug that into Excel you get the green line. So as the as the as the before mean speed goes up, the the change in speed also goes up. You get the biggest. It's what we've seen from from the all the the, the um, studies that the, um, the 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 reduction in speed is greater for the faster roads. But if and I, all I've done is, is is multiply that by six percent to say, well, what what does that mean in terms of um, the reduction in casualties? And of course, you know, we can see that where the mean speed was 26, 27, we are getting a 10 to 12 to 13 percent reduction in casualties, according to that formula predicted, which is not which is not to be sniffed at is, is quite significant. Um, and that's the effect uh, uh, of, 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 of just having a cut off at 24. So Faversham, Faversham, if you if you don't know it, is a small town in Kent. It's on the A2, which is a Roman road, a very straight road that runs past uh, the settlement. It, it has about 20,000 people that live there. Um, and it's an inter interesting place in that um, you've got the um, estuary to the north um, and the, the London road, the Roman road to the south, uh, and very little through traffic. So if you drive into Faversham, it probably means, well, it pretty much means that you have business there. You either live there or you work there, um, or you're actually driving between two points within Faversham. And so, and, and it's not a particularly big place, it's a, a mile or two across. So it has a lot of self-containment in terms of its of its trips. And we, we felt that was quite important in terms of who's actually um, driving there. And, and, and by and large, there will be people with an interest in, in the locality. So um, we, we were brought in actually by the town council, uh, or in fact, initially a campaign group, then they, they, they um, um, brought it to the town council, and so the third tier authority beneath the county and Swale district um, felt that they wanted to um, introduce a town-wide limit, and their and their aims were reducing road casualties, um, quite understandably, but also improving air quality. There is a, there is an air quality action zone on, on part of the A2, uh, and and they also had a strong um, desire to reduce health inequalities, particularly adult and child obesity. There, there are wards within Faversham that have very severe levels of child obesity, um, sadly. Uh, and they felt that a consistent town-wide limit was simpler and cheaper to sign and promote. Um, if you carve up the town into 20 mile an hour um, residential areas and keep the radial routes into the town centre at 30, then every side street you have to have a gateway and, and, and bigger signs to tell you are now entering a 20 mile an hour area. <clears throat> and of course it's much less um, understandable to drivers of, um, uh, of whether they're in a 20 zone or 20 area or a 30 area. So the feeling was that the bigger it's made it's cheaper and, and more likely to be effect changing behaviour. So <clears throat> we, um, Kent County Council had put out some um, speed uh, tubes and co collected speed data and they found, not surprisingly, that on these, some of these radial routes going into town, the speeds were above the magic 24 miles per hour. So Kent's initial view was, well, I'm sorry, but you can't do it. It's not in line with our policy. 
um, you've either got to traffic harm those roads, in which case no one's got any money to do that, or you've got it, all you can have are kind of uh, discrete areas of the town with 20 limits. We were actually fortunate enough to be able to get some better data though, or what we felt to be better data. Those tubes were put down in, in free, deliberately put down in free flow, free flow locations and therefore didn't capture average speeds. We used some data that came from Ordnance Survey that was derived from cars GPS systems that gave us um, a complete measurement of speed over, over um, quite short, uh, the whole town and quite short lengths of road that gave us a slightly different picture. And that showed that the vast majority of town was actually within the 20 to 24, even though there were still parts of these radial routes um, that were above 24, but it brought the um, the number of kind of um, difficult cases that exceeded the current policy, it brought them down and, and just helped um, Kent to um, to move their policy, let's just say, be a bit more flexible. And so we, we after a lot of to and fro, it took us about two to three years to get to this point, we did agree a scheme for a town-wide 20 limit with Kent County Council, the Highway Authority was very pleased to. We couldn't quite get the A2, the um, which did mean, as you can see there, we had to have a lot of gateway signs as, as you come into these residential roads that come off the A2, um, but we just felt that the A2 was a, a step too far, and, and so we, we kind of settled for that. Um, and we in one or two places we did um, say that we did need some conventional traffic calming, but quite small areas. But for the vast majority, we were going for more, um, perhaps, um, what we call psychological measures, um, including gateway. So we thought it's really important if we're going to have a whole town limit to have some really strong gateways, particularly the main roads, to, to really show to drivers. And this was just a mock up. This is Waltham Forest in London, which is a very successful scheme that's, that's changed um, road user behaviour through some quite bold interventions. Um, so planters and, and 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 signs, and these were just kind of examples, really. But we, we you know we would go bold on some gateway signs, and then on on these radial routes where the speeds are a little higher than we would like, we would do something quite simple, which is to remove the road centre line. This is this is one of the streets in Faversham. You can see there's a road centre line there, but it has absolutely no value at all because you can't drive on either side of the centre line because it's generally parked up with vehicles, and and evidence shows that. When you put a centre line like that, all it does is give drivers greater confidence uh, that they that of the linearity of the road and means that they travel a little faster. And and Transport for London have done some research on this. They took a piece of the South Circular a few years ago, and when they resurfaced it, they simply didn't put the red, the, the white line back in the centre, and they got speed differences of between two and four miles per hour. So you know, quite significant. Would bring would would bring some of these radial routes down from that kind of tricky. 26, 27, 28 miles per hour into something where Kent were more comfortable, closer to the 24 uh, magic number that they were that was in their policy. So, we, and of course, it's very cheap to do that, just to burn off the centre line. It doesn't cost very much. So, so where we are now, it's the phase one, which has been done under an experimental traffic regulation order, which means that there was no formal consultation. The consultation is going on now, so that they've implemented the scheme and it's gone in with COVID money. Um, and it's been done um, just with 20 limit signs and gateways, local centre line removal, but not the full thing. And then if it's made permanent, then we get some physical traffic calming in one or two places, area wide centre line removal. And then these things called community corners and enhanced gateways, where the community would actually play a part in, in building um, planters and artwork and, and to really signify the change um, that's expected in driver behaviour. And also that's a way of, of, of the community kind of saying to itself, actually, this is the right speed to drive. Because as I said earlier, you know, one of the big things about Faversham is that most people who drive there either live or work there. And so it's kind of up to the, lo the, the, the local residents what, what speed they want to drive at through their town. And so it's gone live. And so, you know, we, we are, um, uh, the monitoring's happening now uh, and we just hope it's a success or just to be a success. Um, but what it has done, it Kent had to change their policy to bring it in. And so they've now accepted that where the prevailing road speeds are between 24 and 28, and there is strong community support and local benefits, then they will consider this kind of scheme as a, as a pilot, which we're really pleased about. So um, we hope it's a success uh, and, we, and we hope it does kind of stick. So, so that's kind of Kent. And then I'll just um, move on to, to Wales, which is kind of, you know, taking another step above really, which is a whole, 
nation of, of the UK. Um, so I was lucky enough to chair a, a task force in reported uh, just recently um, um, that looked at this whole question of how we could bring in um, a default 20 limit for urban areas across the whole of Wales. And I'm pleased to say that the report was accepted by the Welsh Parliament and has been passed with an overwhelming um, majority. And, and now work is starting to begin on developing some pilots uh, for this. So um, what's going to have to happen is to pass some legislation. So what will happen is, is that the law will change in Wales so that if there is street lighting and there is no sign, then the speed limit is 20, whereas in the rest of the UK, it will be 30. So what that means is that you no longer have to make the case for 20, you have to make the case for 30. Why would you choose to increase the speed limit from the national default? Um, so that's a really important change and places the kind of burden of proof on those who would want to see a higher speed limit. So we need to get some changes to regulations. We would remove all the need for all these these um, repeater signs because the default is now 20, so you don't need those anymore. You would need those in 30 areas to remind people that the speed limit is 30. Um, we need to change the highway code. So there's a lot to do. It's a huge, it's a huge project. Um, um, but hopefully the default speed limit will be in force in um, April 2023. That's what we're aiming for. Um, there'll be an exceptions process. So 20 miles per hour is not appropriate everywhere. There are some roads like this where very few people live and the geometry means that it, it's not such a problem to have 30. So um, um, local authorities will still be en entirely free to um, nominate roads that are 30, but it's, it's proposed to have a nationally consistent approach to that exception process. So Transport for Wales will produce some draft speed limit maps to show based on a set of national criteria where normally you would have a 30 limit as opposed to a 20 and then the local authority would review that uh, with with public consultation so the maps would look like this and and this was these were some very first stabs to prove a kind of proof of concept so we look at these major roads and based on some criteria like the number of front doors number of people living on those roads proximity to schools so on and so forth would you go for a 20 or would you go for 30 um based on 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 those criteria all to, all to be tested through the through the pilots over the next year or two. Um, it's really important, as Ruth said, that the public perceives the enforcement is there, and that does mean changes to policies of the police. So, um, and, and the um, there's a lot of a dialogue going on with the police and crime commissioners, who are political appointees that that are political um, elected officials that set police policies. And the recommendation probably is to go for average speed camera enforcement followed by what's called go safe, which is um, uh, an arm's length body, um, then the community, and then the police is a kind of last resort. Um, and we'll develop that enforcement regime as part of the pilots. But one thing I just mentioned though, is that um, in time, and it's not very long, um, that enforcement will be, will be courtesy of Jaguar, BMW, et cetera, et cetera, because your car will know what the speed limit is um, and 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 your car will will push back at you if you try to exceed the speed limit. And all new model cars from May of next year, it's May May of twenty twenty two, will have this fitted as standard. And all new cars of any model will will have it fitted as standard from May twenty twenty four. And that's in the EU and in the UK. So that burden of enforcement we think will get easier. And we think there's a case for local authorities, transport operators to pledge and to fit speed um, limiters to their vehicles in the evening in advance of that. So you begin to get pace cars and pace vehicles that set the default speed. Um, there's a, it's a bit, it's, this is a, a massive behavior change um, campaign. And, and actually I would say that, uh, that the, the genius for this whole initiative did start with, with public health um, researchers and public health academics. So um, it's come from that, 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 from, from, from that world. Um, so, and, and, and there's been uh, parallel research done about how to do it. So um, uh, really good case, a, a really good um, thinking about how that's to be done and, and have to be done nationally to, to, to change what the normative behaviour is. Um, and, and the idea that this moves then from in the early years, it's the police and, and backup to enforce it, followed by intelligent speed assistance, followed effectively by, by the self. It's the self that, that enforces it and it's internalised and it's just what everybody does. Um, uh, and, and it becomes, you know, uh, socially unacceptable to to speed. Um, meanwhile, in England, and this is really my, my last but one slide, just to say um, um, authorities like Birmingham have asked the Secretary of State in England for a, uh, a similar change. 
Um, but as you can see there, um, the Secretary of State uh, or the Department for Transport has no plans to legislate for such a change in, in England. So um, perhaps they will watch to see what happens in Wales. So as, so as a recap, um, my view is 20 MPH signing limits, they do have real safety benefits or real benefits, even without full compliance. So it depends what you regard as success. Is compliance success or is improving road safety, air quality, increasing active travel success? And I would say the latter. Those area-wide limits are supported. In Faversham, the approach was to tolerate some non-compliance in return for a comprehensive scheme and to start with low-cost interventions with local people in involvement. Anywhere else, let's just do the whole country. So um, I hope that's, uh, that's, that's a useful, useful overview. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Phil. Again, a, another really um, engaging talk, uh, looking at your experiences um, and sharing those with us. And and certainly just right from the, the off at the beginning of the presentation, when you talked about how in Portsmouth, you know, it has been possible to implement those wider 20 mile an hour limits and, and looking back to Ruth's presentation um, and, and the two different approaches to the to the city centre approach and the citywide approach and, and and the differences there, I think again that's that's evidence to to focus on that 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 wider approach when when trying to implement something like this. 